Hi there. First things first, I guess, thank you so much, everyone, who watched my last video. I was not expecting that at all. I am um, <laughs> in shock, for sure. I absolutely plan on creating more videos. Also, I'm not having my hopes up that all my videos will do that well. I think the YouTube algorithm gods shine down upon me. But um, I have loads of good ideas for, for my next load of videos. So keep an eye out for those. Yeah, so on to today's video. I am... Um, I built some clocks, essentially. What will become very apparent in how I designed my redstone is I had an idea for a build. And as part of that build, I wanted some redstone functionality that I couldn't find if somebody had already done. So I made it myself. So people have made analog clocks in Minecraft before, of course. These, by the way, I'm using as demonstrations for the mechanics that people use, but the actual designs themselves are mine. The mechanics behind the displays are quite easy to find on YouTube, on the internet. So most people, when they make analog clocks in Minecraft, they use either redstone lamps, which is really cool, mechanics are really cool, but it's not the aesthetic I'm going after, or they use pistons to push blocks. But in my mind, the contrast between the hands and the background is just not high enough for what I want. And also most of the analog clocks you'll find to have eight hands or eight numbers I should say instead of 12. And I want a more realistic 12 number clock. So that's what I've made here using powdered snow with item frames as the background and pushing blocks to displace lava as the background. So the actual mechanics behind the powdered snow is quite simple. You just have a load of dispensers organized like this and you cover the whole surface with with maps. So I found out while messing around that unlike most blocks, when you dispense powdered snow into the same block as an item frame, the item frame doesn't pop off. You kind of got to make really intricate map art to do this, but I found that maybe the best option, and especially the easiest option, is to do a full grey background. You take an empty map, go to the end, fly into the void so that there's no end stone around, open the map, and then come back and you'll have a fully grey map. I'll go over the mechanics of how this sort of functions now. Both of the clocks use very similar mechanics, though the lava one is a bit more complicated but i'll start with the powdered snow clock first so maybe the most integral part of the whole device is having a way to cycle between 12 options 12 redstone outputs that then cycles back to the start after it reaches the end or if a pulse is sent to reset it which would be a player sleeping in the bed so this is what I came up with to do that. It is essentially a line of droppers all facing into the next one, except for the last, which faces down. And then the cycle continues through a line of locked hoppers, which become unlocked when you want it to reset. And finally, when these hoppers are unlocked, they'll send a pulse into this dropper, restarting the whole system. And so for the sake of speed, there are two items in this at all times. One representing which hour it is, so currently it's set to 6 o'clock. And one ready to go for the next time it resets. So you can see here by sending a pulse into the back here, an item gets passed from one dropper to the other. And when it reaches this hopper here, or if a signal is sent to reset it, this pulse extender will be powered, turning all these redstone torches off. One important caveat, I guess, for this is that this has to be powered from the opposite direction you want to send the item. The reason for this is that Minecraft is broken up into, into ticks where events are scheduled with a certain time frame. When you power a redstone line, everything that should be powered is powered within one tick. However, within a tick itself, events can be scheduled in different orders. And so for redstone, the order that they're powered propagates out from where the power is generated. So when this observer powers this redstone, within a single tick, this one turns on first, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, and so on. Meaning, if we were to swap the order, say if this was powered from this side, 
the item now instantly travels from one side to the other because these droppers are all being powered one after the other within a single tick, forcing the item to travel through all of them within a tick. This is very useful for some contraptions, but the exact opposite of what we want here. We want the item to move one dropper at a time. And the easiest way to do that is powering these in the wrong order. Next, we need a way to count the hours, basically. Because a full 24 hours day is 20 minutes, that means an hour is 50 seconds. So the easiest way to do this is with regular old hopper clocks, with very slight variations, essentially. So this is 126 items, which I timed to be as close to 50 seconds as I could get it. And instead of a regular etho hopper clock, where you take the output from one side, instead I'm taking the output from the middle, so two blocks that touch both locations is where this redstone block will be, because when it moves from one block to the other, it'll briefly turn off. The reason for doing this instead of the classic hopper clock way is that this is designed to be able to be reset whenever somebody sleeps through the night. When my sleep through the night detector here, which I'll go over in a sec, detects it's the next morning, this redstone block here will be moved back or forth, switching from one of these hop clocks to the other. The reason for that is, of course, that you may have been in the middle of an hour when you start sleeping, and you want to reset to the start of six o'clock. But I found that using regular hopper clocks, when you lock the hopper, it becomes locked in the half hour state. So by taking a pause every time the redstone block moves at all, it doesn't matter which direction the hopper clock locks in, because there'll always be the zero minute mark. So finally we need to detect players sleeping in a bed to both reset these hopper clocks and to reset this system. And the way that this is done is using, of course, daylight detectors. But what's important in this instance is we don't want to just detect when it's morning. We want to detect specifically when players have slept in bed because we don't want to, the clock to reset when it doesn't have to. If a player doesn't sleep in the bed and it becomes 6 a.m. again, there's no point resetting from 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. So how do you detect the difference between sleeping through the night or sleeping through a storm? and it just becoming morning. And the way I found to do this is essentially to notice that when the light changes throughout the day, the level of this redstone will incrementally increase and decrease. So it will continually increase by one until it reaches midday and then decrease by one as the light decreases. But when you sleep in a bed, within one tick, the redstone level will be fr go from zero to propagating all the way to this block. So we want a way of sending a pulse if and only if these two repeaters turn on at the exact same time without this third repeater turning on. The reason for that is of course that if the light was cycling the way it usually does, this redstone will turn on before this, then this one will turn on, then this one will turn on. And we don't want the signal to be propagated out when that happens. Similarly, we don't want the signal to happen when all three of these are on and this one turns off. This is just the simple setup I made for that, where the first two have a repeater set to two ticks and the third has a repeater set to one. The reason this works is that when the light will change gradually, one block after the other, this repeater will power this redstone here forcing this piston up, meaning that no power can be transmitted out. If all three turned on at the same time, then this one will turn on before any of the others, because this is repeater is set to a lower value, which means no signal can propagate through. But if and only if these two repeaters turn on at the exact same time, then a pulse can be sent through this block before it has a chance to extend, creating our reset signal. Now, the only downside of this is it isn't able to detect when players sleep through a storm. So that's what this extra bit here is for. If you sleep through the night, the signal abruptly turns on to this repeater here. How you sleep through a storm, 
the light level will still change slowly. So to fix this, what we have to do is add a repeater here after the signal has a chance to decrease by one. And what this basically does is it turns that gradual change in light into a sharp cutoff. So now we have a redstone system with 12 redstone outputs, which incrementally goes from one to the other, thanks to a timer set to 50 seconds that can be reset via sleeping in the bed to sleep through a night or a storm. All we have to do now is display that. So this is not the most compact way of doing this, but essentially all of these redstone signals now will go into this sort of repeater spam to isolate each of these channels and send it towards a trap door. Why trap doors, you may be asking. I'm sure a lot of you aren't, but some of you might be. The reason is that scaffolding has this really nice property that you can send redstone signals upwards extremely fast compared to other systems. It is constantly checking if the blocks below it are supported or not, meaning that if it's directly connected to the ground or to a, a full block. If you were to use a trapdoor to, to make that block alternate between being a flat surface and not, a signal is propagated up telling the scaffolding at the top that this block at the bottom is no longer supported. So each of these signals then corresponds to one of these trapdoors, which sends a signal up to observers, which then fire the dispensers. The last important note here is that the timings are very important. There's a strange thing that happens with dispensers where there's a slight directionality. So I have two of the same setup but rotated 90 degrees here where the signal will power both of these droppers at the exact same time. And as you can see everything works fine but if these repeaters here are set to two ticks instead of one, they dispense fine, but they do not undispense fine in this specific configuration anyway. So it depends on which direction you build this in, but facing north in this direction, you end up with a strange failure state here. So all that really means though, is that the timings are very important. Next is onto the lava clock. There's one main difference with the lava clock. So this uses pistons to extend blocks to displace lava, but doing that is not as simple as firing dispensers because of a thing called quasi-connectivity. Now there are lots of really good explainers for quasi-connectivity on the internet, so I won't go into too much detail here, but the upshot is essentially that a piston, like this one here, can be powered by blocks that are adjacent to itself, but also ones that are adjacent to the blocks above it. So say, two blocks above or one diagonally upwards. The folktale for how this happened was that when they were originally coding the pistons, they copied and pasted the code for doors because you can open and close doors from the, the top block as well as the bottom. And by the way, this doesn't just happen because this, this piston is here. All this piston is doing for this one is it's updating it. For instance, you can still power this piston like this, but it doesn't move until you update it. So this is a problem because we want to be able to individually turn on one of these pistons at a time. Say in this situation, we want these two pistons to turn on, then we want this one, then this one, then this one, then these two. But we can't do them individually. So how do we fix this? Essentially by very careful ordering. You can isolate one block by ordering your piston pushes. So for instance, if I fire this one first, then this one, then this one, I can get just one block being extended. And then as long as I go through the whole sequence, I can go back to zero. In this specific sequence, we want these two, then just this one, then this one, then this one, then these two again. And all you have to do for that is a sequence that goes like two, one, three, four, six, five. And although that's very tricky, <laughs> 
it is possible to do with some creative redstone wiring. Also, because to go back to zero, this has to go through the entire cycle. We don't want it to get stuck in the middle when somebody sleeps in the bed. So, so the reset is slightly different to do that. Instead of unlocking all these hoppers to just pull the item straight out, instead, this clock here will generate pulses until it reaches the end of the cycle, which will turn the clock off. And the final bit of weirdness is just that lava has very strange properties with how it likes to flow. Let's say it's nine o'clock and it will suddenly become 10 o'clock. To do that, all we have to do is retract nine o'clock and extend the 10 o'clock. Ooh, but that's a problem. There is now a gap underneath the hand. This was actually really tricky to get working, but the knack for filling out these gaps, all you have to do is momentarily redirect lava into that gap. And then when you undo whatever redirection you did, the lava will stay there, it will persist. The way to do this is essentially by retracting or extending blocks to just nudge the lava in the right direction. So in this situation here, in the 10 o'clock, all we do is we briefly retract that block and extend it again. And now the lava looks much nicer. As I, I'll show here with, from the time-lapse footage, this is required for the nine o'clock and the 10 o'clock. For the nine o'clock, this block is extended momentarily to move the lava over. That was a lot simpler to do than the 10 o'clock version. For 10 o'clock, a signal is created from the 10 o'clock line, sent through this observer into this pulse extender, which is then sent up via this extra scaffolding into an OR gate. This is an observer OR gate. So you can either power this piston by sending a signal through this observer or through this observer. So what this basically does is it means that at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, this observer will fire. And so with that, I have two working designs for analog redstone clocks with really good contrast in my mind anyway. So I hope that was useful. Like I said, I have some really good ideas for my upcoming videos. Important note is I am on the home stretch of doing a PhD, so don't expect like, you know, professional YouTuber schedule of videos. I'll try and put out as many videos as I can when I can, but obviously a PhD takes up a lot of your time. But I really hope you enjoyed. Again, thank you so much to all the support my first video got. And uh, with that, I guess, um, Bye.